Um, as an advisor, Laura Pohl, to Lady Thatcher on foreign affairs, do you recall your first conversations about Ronald Reagan, uh, his position on peace through strength and the growing Soviet military? Could you share those with us? Well, you know, President Reagan featured in very many conversations with Margaret Thatcher. She had a huge admiration for him because it dated from before she was prime minister, before he was president. They had met a couple of times in London and discovered pretty well straight away that they were soulmates in the sense they shared the same world view, the same priorities, the determination to see strong defense, to see the end of communism, and the belief that the state had become too powerful in the United States and in Britain. So they really had a common agenda. So naturally, there was much discussion of President Reagan and his policies whenever I spoke to Mrs. Thatcher, and many meetings between the two of them, which I attended, where it was remarkable how closely alike their thinking was. It was particularly interesting because, of course, in some ways, they were rather different characters. President Reagan was very above the fray, very presidential, very broad brush and so on. Margaret Thatcher was very terrier-like, very much in command of the detail, uh, talked a great deal. But together, they made an unbeatable pair, I always used to think. Why were so many other Western European countries reluctant to demand that the Soviet Union remove the SS-20s and support the American installation of Pershing II missiles in late 1983? Well, you have to understand that the perspective from Europe is always rather different from the perspective from many thousands of miles away of the United States. Many of the European countries lived under the shadow of the Soviet Union, particularly before the fall of the Berlin Wall. Of course, the Soviet armies were right up against Western Europe, and therefore people were understandably a bit nervous, and uh, detente appealed to them strongly. This seemed to be a sort of live and let live, don't let's try and get rid of communism, let's coexist with it, let's all have a quiet life. So I guess that was really the motivation why European countries generally were less determined to challenge the Soviet Union and force it to withdraw its missiles. Uh, luckily, Margaret Thatcher and Chancellor Helmut Schmidt of Germany and later Chancellor Cole, all took a very strong line supporting the United States. So we got it done. But I have to say, it wasn't thanks to many of the smaller European countries. Can you describe Lady Thatcher's reaction and thoughts after her first meeting with Gorbachev? Yes, Lady Thatcher first met President Gorbachev in December 1984. She had invited him in the hope of having a contact with somebody who at the time looked likely to be one of the next leaders of the Soviet Union. He wasn't at the time party secretary or president. And he, she invited him to come down to the British Prime Minister's country residence. She thought, let me see him in a more informal, relaxed surrounding so I can get the measure of him. And of course, she'd never met him before. And when he came into the great hall of Chequers, the Prime Minister's residence, it was an extraordinary experience because he was quite different from any previous Soviet leader. They were mostly elderly, shuffling old men, surrounded by aides, incapable of spontaneous speech, but only reading prepared statements. Here was a man who bounced on the ball of his feet, could debate like a Western politician, uh, and was thoroughly lively and intellectually engaged. And I remember very well, they argued the whole way through lunch, and afterwards we retired to the library um, for a meeting destined to last, uh, last half an hour, which actually lasted three hours, because they were so engaged with each other. And she was absolutely convinced by the end of this meeting that here was somebody quite different. Here was a, somebody you could actually talk intelligently to. Of course, they didn't agree on many things, but at least you could argue, you could put a point of view and get a rational, intelligent response. And after he had left, she talked to her press spokesman and to me about her impressions. And the phrase she came up with was, he's a man I can do business with. And that, I think, characterized the change. Here at last was a Soviet leader you could do business with. And the next day, she sent a message to President Reagan summarizing her impressions of President Gorbachev uh, and using that phrase. And three weeks later, when the President and Mrs. Thatcher met up at Camp David, they had a long discussion of the implications of Gorbachev becoming leader, as he was destined to do quite shortly. And it was a very positive move forward at a time when relations between the Soviet Union and the United States were at a very low point. How important was the selection of Shepard Nazi? I think that was important, too, because he, like Gorbachev, was open-minded, more liberal, uh, more rational. Uh, and again, compared with Gromyko, you could actually have an intelligent discussion with him. And I think between the two of them, they really changed the Soviet approach in foreign affairs. 
I'm not sure how much they really wanted to, but they did realize that communism had had its day. It wasn't working. Now, they made a mistake. They thought they could, they thought they could reform communism and still keep it. Actually, of course, it just didn't work at all, and they had, in the end, to abandon it. But at least they were decent people, and when the great crunch came in 1989 and 90, with the fall of the Berlin Wall, they did not use force to keep the Eastern European countries in line, as all previous Soviet leaders had done and would do. They were tolerant, and they were liberal, and they were prepared to accept change. And the reason for that was because President Reagan and Margaret Thatcher throughout the 80s had been utterly firm. They were determined not to let the Soviet Union expand its power. They were determined to stop the spread of communism and put such pressure on it that it had no alternative but to change. At the time, you were in the middle of this, observing this, and, and you saw these, the, the, the power of these two leaders. Did you, did you at night, when you turned the lights out, thought, they're going to do it? They're going to be successful. Well, if I'm honest, I thought that they were right. But I wasn't convinced they were going to do it in their lifetime. And you know, it's quite interesting. I remember Margaret Thatcher saying in early 1989 that she did not expect to see the end of communism in her lifetime. Less than a year later, it was virtually dead. Of course, it lingers on in North Korea and Cuba, but I mean, it's dead as an ideology. And so the end came much more suddenly than she foresaw, and I think probably more suddenly than President Reagan foresaw. But the truth is, they had taken the steps, they had the policies, which ensured that it did come to an end. Do you recall her reaction and your reaction to the speech in 1987 when President Reagan asked Gorbachev to tear down the wall? Yes, it was a very powerful speech. Uh, really two speeches, I think, would stick in my mind. One was President Reagan's speech at the Guild Hall in London in 1982, when he set out what we call the Freedom Agenda. And that really became the guiding light for both him, for her, and indeed for the West as a whole throughout the rest of his presidency in foreign affairs. And then when he went to Berlin and saw the monstrosity of the Berlin Wall and made that powerful speech, one felt that this was an open challenge to the Soviet Union that they, they could never be accepted as a civilized society if they maintained that sort of brutal division of Europe. So it had a huge impact at the time. Were you in Berlin at the time? No. No, you were in London. Um, do you recall where you were in 1961 when the wall went up? I was a university student in 1961, and I do recall it. And I remember being appalled by this, uh, the brutal fashion in which a country and a city were being divided uh, it represented for me, even as a student exposed to radical ideas, the clearest possible demonstration of the failures of communism. If you had to, if you had to build a wall to keep people in, it couldn't have been much of a system or much of a society. And as an international businessman, what is your greatest concern facing the business community today? Well, of course, we're now at a very difficult juncture in the whole world economy, and we all have many concerns about how to restore growth and. Uh, get back to fuller employment and so on. I think probably my greatest economic worry is free trade. That was another agenda which President Reagan stoutly and strongly supported, keeping markets open. Um, and now in the present difficult economic situation, there's a lot of pressure on countries to take trade restricting measures. Even I'm ashamed to say the United States, uh, which has been sticking extra duties on imports from China. Uh, that mustn't happen. If we get back to the situation in the 1930s when we imposed tariffs, uh, world trade shrunk, we shall never get out of the present economic difficulties. So keeping markets open, supporting free trade, there's nothing more important than that.